Good morning and welcome to today's meeting. This meeting is a joint meeting by Carnegie Endowment for Peace and the Middle East program at the Wilson Center. Uh, we are delighted to have with us today in the audience uh, Jane Harmon, the Director, President, and CEO of the Wilson Center, and Ambassador Gildenhorn, uh, former Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Wilson Center, uh, who is a supporter of the Middle East uh, program. Uh, I'm Hale Svandiari. I run the Middle East program at the center. Uh, usually, when I introduce myself, I say, uh, you are attending a meeting with a former convict. Uh, I'm very happy to say today that you are in a room with two former convicts. <laughs> and uh, as uh, fate wants it, uh, both imprisoned in Iran, myself and Ambassador John Limburg. We both had the pleasure of being the guest of the Islamic Republic of Iran. He in the early days of the revolution and me almost towards the end of the second decade of the revolution. Uh, as we speak, the Islamic Republic is celebrating the 35th anniversary and the supreme leader has called on millions of peoples to come out in cities, town, and villages across Iran tomorrow to show Iran's enemy, i.e., especially the United States, that the people of Iran support fully the regime and the government. The last 35 years have been tumultuous years for Iran. The revolution, the hostage crisis, the Iran-Iraq war, the rise and fall of President Khatami, and the rise, and I don't think we can say yet the demise of former President Ahmadinejad and the conservatives. Iran's political venture beyond its borders, Iran's nuclear program, the sanction regime, and finally, Iran's 180 degree turnabout in initiating nuclear talks and the potential deal with the West. This is the first of three meetings on Iran that we will hold in the next three months. In order to get a sense of what took place in Iran in the last 35 years, I have asked four top experts to join us today. We will start with Shaul Bahash, no re not related to me, a historian <laughs> who stayed in Iran and witnessed the fall of the monarchy and the rise of the Islamic revolutionaries in Iran and the excitement it created. In the dedication of his book, The Reign of the Ayatollah, he wrote, to my Iranian friends who loved the revolution, not knowing it would not love them back. <laughs> that says it all in a nutshell. Our second speaker, John Limbert, a historian, a Middle East expert, who witnessed the early days of the revolution as an American hostage, for 444 days. He's a diplomat by profession who I think knows better than anyone the art of negotiations with Iran and the give and take with the Islamic Republic. He's the author of the book, Negotiating with Iran. He will speak on the effect of the hostage crisis on Iranian domestic and foreign policy. Our third speaker, Karim Sajjadpour, is a member of what I call the second generation of post-revolution Iran experts. He just reminded me that his first exposure as a speaker in this town was at the Wilson Center. He tells me he was nervous to be very punctual <laughs> that day, but he was punctual today too. I first met him in Tehran when he was the analyst for the International Crisis Group. I didn't know then that because of political developments, neither he nor I prefer not to return to Iran for the time being. 
You are all familiar with his firm grasp of Iranian affairs and his sound take on developments in the Islamic Republic. He will talk today about the reformist movement. Our last speaker, who is speaking at the center for the first time, therefore I extend a special welcome to him, is Mehdi Khalaji. And I wonder how many of you met someone who spent his formative years in a seminary in the city of Bom. He went, he attended the seminary at the age of 11 and spent 14 years studying theology and then moved on to get a degree in philosophy from Qom University. He's extensively knowledgeable about Iran's powerful clerical leaders and clerical networks. I've asked him to speak about how the conservatives in Iran perceive themselves and what vision they have for Iran. You have the, uh, the bios of our speakers, so no need for me to go into detail. Each speaker will speak no more than 12 minutes, preferably even less, and I hope we will be left with over half an hour, maybe 45 minutes, for short questions and brief uh, answers. Shaul, you, you can sit there and speak. Thank you. You have um, the Iranian Revolution, as uh, Hale just said, marks its 35th anniversary tomorrow. I'm supposed to speak about the moment of creation of this revolution. And in my remarks, I want to highlight the distinguishing features of the revolution here and there using the Egyptian um, events uh, during the Arab Spring only three years ago um, as my foil, imperfect as it may be. Uh, I hope to highlight why in Iran we had a full-blown revolution and in Egypt what appears to be a stillborn one. First, I think it's important to note that the Iranian revolution took time to mature. The first major protests began in January of 1978 and continued for an entire year until the collapse of the monarchy in January of 1979. Consider the contrast with Egypt. A mere 18 days passed between the first large-scale Egyptian protests and the resignation of President Mubarak. In Iran, we wit witnessed an entire year of un almost uninterrupted protests, demonstrations, uh, pamphleteering, and strikes. Moreover, in Iran, the protests were not confined to Tehran. It was a multi-urban phenomenon. By the late summer and early fall of 1978, almost all Iran's major cities and many, many small towns were in upheaval. And this translated into an extraordinary wide mobilization as more and more elements of the population were drawn into the opposition movement. Um, this drawn out struggle also allowed the opposition, especially the men around Khomeini, to sharpen their message, to expand their networks, and to create, um, and here I use the term with some caution, to create the embryo of a parallel state. And moreover, this lengthy struggle radicalized and hardened the opposition, particularly the men around Khomeini. It inculcated in them habits of violence and a desire to extract, extract vengeance on those they believed had oppressed them. Uh, once they seized power, they were fierce in their determination to completely do away with the old um, order and in order to stay in power. And they were willing to purge, imprison, and execute on a large scale if necessary. Indeed, they proved prime exemplars of Mao, of Chairman Mao's stricture that revolution is not a dinner party. <coughs> Equally important, I think, in this continuous day after day confrontation of the state and the people during the year of protests in 1978 <coughs> was that the gradual uh, uh, wearing down of the regime itself. Months of daily confrontations between the army and the protesters led to widespread desertions among the ordinary rank and file in the army. By the fall of 1978, 
except at the very senior levels, the entire civil service had joined um, the revolution. Much of the civil service went on strike. <coughs> the mail wasn't being delivered. Goods could not be released from customs. The banking system was in uh, paralysis. Industry was at a standstill. Oil uh, production was reduced to a trickle. In brief, the, the state had been brought to its knees and the very will of the ruling elites to retain power had been gravely eroded. Um, now, um, the, um, the um, revolution also um, was important for the role the army played in it. In Egypt, the army commanders very quickly withdrew any loyalty they thought they owed to President Mubarak. In Iran, by contrast, the officer corps remained loyal to the Shah to the very end. Um, and uh, uh, naturally, in the eyes of the opposition, the army was not only deeply identified with the Shah, but seen as responsible for the attempt to put down the revolution and the deaths that had occurred on the streets as a result of the clash between the military and the protesters. In addition, once the monarchy was overthrown, fear of counter-revolution was pervasive. As a consequence, dozens of senior military commanders were executed. Very widespread purges took place uh, in the officer corps. Thus, thus, unlike <coughs> in, in the Arab Spring in Egypt, where the army remained intact, ready to seize the opportunity offered by the <coughs> anti-mother Muslim Brotherhood protests to return to power, in Iran, <coughs> the army was denuded of its officer corps. It was disarmed and defanged. Um, and in effect, the revolutionaries made sure that the army was in no position to stage a counter coup. Um, they, of course, also left Iran defenseless, uh, opening the door for Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran in September of 1980, but that is another story. I think in the Iranian Revolution, the role of leadership um, was not only important but critical. Um, the protests of the Arab Spring produced, of course, their own leaders, but Khomeini in Iran uh, stands in a class uh, by himself. I think one could persuasively argue that uh, widespread protests notwithstanding without Khomeini, there would not have been a revolution. He enjoyed enormous prestige because of his religious office, his reputation for incorruptibility, and his long resistance to the Shah's rule. He was a very powerful orator. He had great charisma. His millions of devoted followers attributed to him uh, legendary status, uh, even uh, a touch of the divine. Uh, at the height of the revolutionary turmoil, it was put about and widely believed that Khomeini's face had miraculously appeared on the moon. And he remained steadfast in his insistence that there could be no compromise and that the Shah must go. Khomeini also had a central idea, uh, an idea of Islamic government which captured the imagination of a large swath of the Iranian protest movement. On examination, his treatise on Islamic government suggests only the vaguest notion of how such a government would be organized or how it would work. But the central notion of his treatise, that leadership in government belongs to the community of Islamic jurists as heirs to the mantle of the prophet, became the central pillar of the constitution and the very structure of the Islamic Republic. And it remains so today. And while much has changed in the composition of the ruling elites in Iran since the revolution, with many men of secular backgrounds running the technical ministries, uh, still the commanding heights of power and the most sensitive positions in the state remain controlled by the clerics, in alliance, of course, with the Revolutionary Guards. 
Um, indeed, if President Eisenhower were to deliver a farewell address in Iran today, he would warn against the rise of a military clerical complex. Um, it is true also that a very broad coalition of forces made the Iranian revolution, and we like to think that in Iran, as we like to think in the countries of the Arab Spring, a united people rose in a demand for democracy and good government. But this should not obscure the fact that the Iranian revolution was also a revolution of classes, um, of the underprivileged against the privileged, the poor against the rich, uh, the, uh, the, those excluded from power against the ruling elite in its broadest sense, the upwardly mobile against uh, those already part of the comfortable bourgeoisie. Uh, Mehdi Bazagan, the prime minister of the Islamic Republic, uh, uh, describes a moment wh when offered the prime ministership. Uh, he described to the Revolutionary Council his criteria for choosing his cabinet. His cabinet officers, he said, would be, of course, men of piety and revolutionary credentials, but also men of education, qualifications, and experience. <coughs> Ayatollah Beheshti, uh, Khomeini's principal lieutenant in the Revolutionary Council, responded to these criteria with a firm no. He said to Bazagan, Education, qualifications, experience means you people will still remain in office and hold power. We have our followers too. They also want office and, and positions, and they should uh, get them. If they have no education or experience, we'll appoint deputies uh, who will help them with their job. Now, like Bazagan, I think many of the middle class professionals, members of the intelligentsia, university professors, the broad middle class that thought of themselves as part <coughs> of the uh, opposition against the monarchy, as part of the uh, revolution. But they did not realize that the less privileged saw them as members of the privileged elite who had pr benefited under the old regime and who deserved to be driven out to make room for the newcomers. The same Ayatollah Beheshti told an industrialist who came to see him after his factory had been expropriated, for decades, you people have enjoyed money and position. Now it's our turn. As a result, then, the revolution in Iran resulted in a sweeping transformation of elites. Um, the top ranks of the civil service were almost totally eliminated. A similar pattern occurred in the army and the police forces. The business elite, the industrialists, the contractors, the bankers were expropriated. A great deal of personal wealth was taken over by the state. Uh, similar transformations occurred in universities, in banks, even in hospitals. Um, even um, within the clergy, the highly respected members of the older clerical establishment were gradually marginalized to be replaced by middle rank clerics identified with Khomeini and the revolutionaries. Now, from its very beginnings, the post-revolution politics in Iran has been distinguished by deep divisions and fierce power struggles, uh, both among the groups that were part of the original revolutionary coalition, as the men closest to Khomeini sought to eliminate rivals, and also then within the Khomeini camp itself. As we will recall, the moderate Islamist government of Mehdi Bazagan was brought down um, by uh, the uh, radical students who seized the American embassy. Um, Abul Hassan Bani Saad, the first president, who in his own disorganized way sought to tame the powerful currents uh, released by the revolution, was impeached by um, Khomeini's uh, uh, clerics in the second year of his presidency, after the ouster of Bani Saad, there were men around Khomeini turned on the old guerrilla organizations, and between 1981 and 1953, we witnessed the worst period of terror um, um, under the revolution when executions of 50 a day became routine, and the arrests and gradual elimination of other political parties followed. 
by 1983, the men around Khomeini had taken care of most rival claimants to power. But this inner circle, it turned out, was not united. Splits emerged over a whole range of policies within the inner circle. These remained muted due to the exigencies of the Iran-Iraq war, but emerged in full force after the war. Uh, we have seen in Iran then over the last many years the emergence of various uh, political currents within the inner circle. The, what I might call the Rafsanjani pragmatists, the Khatami reformists, the Ahmadinejad populists, uh, <coughs> and the, fun the conservatives of various stripes, uh, stripes and, and persuasions. Uh, the description of these various currents I would leave to my, uh, my colleagues, to K Karim and to uh, uh, Mr. Khaleji. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saud. Uh, John? <coughs> you have Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you, Shaul, for setting up the very clear explanation of the first revolution. I'm going to talk about what Ayatollah Khomeini, I think with justification, called the second, revo the second uh, Iranian, uh, Iranian revolution. Well, here, here's where we were on the 4th of November, 1979. We should, I think, have heeded the warning of the poet and foreseen the interruption. Obviously, we did not. But whatever else this incident did, it answered two questions. One that was going around Tehran at the time and one that was going around Washington, and one in Tehran was, well, what did we hope for and what did we get? And the other uh, in Washington was, how bad can it be? And uh, that day, I'm afraid we got an answer. It wasn't the answer we wanted, but we did get answers. Now, in the months before this happened, in the spring and the summer of 1979, the Shah's American friends had been urging President Carter to admit the Shah to the United, to admit the deposed Shah to the United States. In July, Secretary of State Vance sought the advice of our charge in Tehran, Ambassador Bruce Langan, uh, about this question. And Ambassador Langan answered very eloquently. He took a page, I think, from St. Augustine. St. Augustine once said, Lord, Give me chastity and continence, but not now. <laughs> uh, I think, I think uh, Ambassador Langan responded equally eloquently, and he said, admit the Shah, yes, at some future time, but not now. Given the conditions in Iran, he said, the United States had a stark choice. We could, e we could do one of two things. We could either continue the very difficult work of rebuilding relations with unpredictable results, or we could admit the Shah with very predictable results. But we could not do both. Langan went on to say, if we do admit the Shah, three things are going to happen. One, we can say goodbye to Prime Minister Bazargan's provisional government of nationalists and religious intellectuals. Two, two, we could say goodbye to any chance of orderly Iranian-American relations in the future. And three, and this was perhaps of more concern to me personally, we could say goodbye to the Tehran embassy. Well, what happened? A few months later, they did it anyway. And events ran 
exactly as Ambassador Langan and President Carter himself had foreseen. Here is a scene from in front of the embassy two days after the initial attack, November 6th, after Khomeini had endorsed it and the provisional government had resigned. By then, what had started out as a 1970s style student sit-in, and some of us will remember those days, uh, had exploded into a full-blown international crisis that would bring down an American president, would send Iran into a 30-year tailspin of misrule at home and missteps abroad. And today, 34 years later, those events from here continue to cast their shadows over Iran's domestic politics and particularly relations with the United States. What was the point of it all? I mean, beyond any political purpose, um, I still think, I suspect that a major motive for the attackers on that day was the desire of some young Iranian students, men and women, to meet each other. We remember, some of us may remember this from our own marching day, from our own marching days. I mean, doing so in Iran particularly was never easy. Uh, but these young people found a way. They were resourceful. And even, they found a way that even Ayatollah Khomeini could endorse and say, yes, that's OK. But whatever their motive, um, whatever their motive, it soon became clear that neither the US nor the deposed Shah were the occupier's real targets. They had other fish to fry. In, in subsequent conversations, the attackers themselves have said that their chief purpose was to bring down Bazargan's provisional government, uh, which was not revolutionary enough for their taste and which they suspected of preparing to establish orderly relations with the United States. Now, in the hysteria that followed the occupation, the attackers and their allies went even further and crushed their former coalition partners, which Shaul has spoken about, uh, whom they called the, the hated liberals, the liberal ha. They used that just, just that word. Now, the reality is, at the end, that the attackers, whatever their motive was, were responsible for ending any chance of the revolutions establishing a democratic system that would respect the rights of Iran citizens. Now, the history, I'm a historian, history is full of irony. And these same attackers, about 20 years later, presumably older and wiser, uh, became officials in so-called reformist cabinets. And they became reciters of brave slogans about rule of law and civil society. The very ideas they had helped destroy 20 years earlier. Here you see two of our hosts, uh, Habibullah Bitaraf, who later became Minister of Energy under the reformist President Khatemi, and of course, uh, Nilufar or Masume, uh, take your choice, uh, Eptekar, uh, later uh, to become Vice President for Environmental Affairs under. Uh, Presidents uh, Khatemi and now President Rouhani. Uh, uh, Rouhani. And the events of the last 33 years continue, they continue to echo, sometimes in, in ways you don't expect. Uh, for example, in, in 1980, in the heat of the crisis, um, Ayatollah Khomeini taunted Washington and taunted President Carter personally, uh, when he famously said, Amrika hich galati nemi means 
politely translate, was politely translated as America can't do a damn thing. It's a very nasty phrase in Persian. And since this is a PG rated presentation, <laughs> um, I won't translate it. I won't go any farther than that. I won't go any farther than that. Well, that slogan reappeared. This is a demonstration from about, I think, a year and a half ago, a year and a half ago after an American drone, uh, drone aircraft came down over Iranian territory and it was shown, here is the Maidane, here's the Azadi Square um, in, Te in Tehran, a big anti-American rally. And if you know, if it's a little hard to read, but in the back is the, they resurrected the slogan and the banner says, um, in Persian, America can't do a damn thing. What's interesting about this, however, is the translation. Underneath is written the <laughs> translation, America can do no wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, in you know, 2011, 2012, unlike 1980, we had Google Translate. <laughs> and somehow that's what it came out. <laughs> that's what it came out to be. <laughs> But the, the reality is the Islamic Republic has had difficulty coming to terms with what happened 34 years ago. Still has difficulty. Its reaction seemed to me, it seems to vary between, between two extremes. One is complete denial. Hostages? What hostages? Never heard of them. Or claiming that these were <coughs> events that happened a long time ago in a galaxy far away. <laughs> I mean, when the film Argo won the Best Picture Oscar last, ye last year, the Islamic Republic was not happy. Uh, and I think the reason was that the film, whether you think it's a good film or a bad film, it, may, it forced people there to confront a dark chapter in their history, and that made people uncomfortable. Now here, if I, here in conclusion, here is a recent photo from the front gate of the, em from the, front gate of the embassy. You see that's a, that's a mock-up with a cloth, and they've opened to the special exhibition, open to the public. Um, and I think this may be symbolic, this, uh, this, this, uh, Open, this may be symbolic of larger changes within the Islam, um, Islamic Republic. But, I mean, there is still a hard core in Iran, um, in the Islamic Republic. I call them the equivalent of our, of our own birthers, um, who insist, despite all evidence to the contrary, that the embassy seizure was a good thing. And even if it led to years of mob rule, uh, repress repression, brutality, and to Iran's making so many gratuitous enemies that almost no one objected in 1980 when Saddam invaded and no one spoke up when Saddam used poison gas. But this open to the public sign to me is interesting. I mean, maybe it could, this could be an Iranian version of glasnost. Uh, and may be symbolic of larger changes in the Islamic Republic's relations with the rest of the world, especially with the U.S. I mean, we see now both sides, after 34, after 34 years, have made a very startling discovery that diplomacy, with its long-neglected tools of listening, of uh, seeking small areas of agreement, uh, of careful choice of words, can actually accomplish something and can accomplish more than shouting insults, uh, making threats, and the wonderful self-satisfaction of always being right. Thank you. Okay. Um, is it on? Yeah, it okay. works. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for coming and, and thank you, Hala, for inviting me. Before I start, I, I preface my comments by saying <clears throat> I would be
hard pressed to find four people in Washington whom I've learned more from uh, about Iran than, than John, Shaul, Hale, and Mehdi. So it's a real privilege to be speaking alongside them. Uh, Hale asked me to speak about the rise and fall of the reform movement in Iran, uh, the, the movement of the presidency of Mohammad Khatami, which had the presidency from 1997 to 2005. Uh, I think rather than talking about them in the past tense, I will talk about them in the present tense because I would argue for two reasons. Uh, Iran's reform movement has arguably been uh, rehabilitated, if not vindicated. And I would say those two reasons are the failure of the Arab Spring and the second is the election of Hassan Rouhani. And I'll go back to why I think those two reasons have, um, have rehabilitated them. Um, but specifically, I'd like to probe three questions in the time which I have. Well, the first is, who are the reformists? You know, who, wh what was the reform movement? Uh, the second is, what are their goals? What are they hoping to achieve? And the third is, what is their strategy? So <clears throat> on the first question of what was the reform movement? Who are the, reform who are the reformists? Who are Iran's reformists? Uh, as John mentioned in a sentence, they are um, – former revolutionaries who became disillusioned with the revolution and are now trying to reform the system. Um, they come from traditional backgrounds, uh, religious backgrounds. They're men and women, but mostly men. And if you look at their trajectory over the last three and a half decades, it's been quite a roller coaster. Um, at the very beginning, they were very much illusioned by the revolution. They were, in many ways, utopianists. And towards the end of the first decade of the revolution, they became disillusioned with the, the, the direction which, in which the revolution headed. And so they called for a course correction. And so by, by the second decade of the revolution, um, they became very much illusioned again about the prospect of reforming the Islamic Republic into a more democratic system of governance. Uh, by midway or, or towards the end of the era of Muhammad Khatami, I think they again became disillusioned about their ability to reform the Islamic Republic into a more democratic system of governance. And I think their, 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 their most recent um, uh, psychological mood is, is one which is uh, much more realistic about their ability or inability to affect dramatic change in Iran. And I think they're much more realistic now about uh, the pace uh, of, of reform. Now, who, who are the leaders of the refor reform movement? I would still say to this day that Mohammad Khatami, the president, remains the de facto leader of the reform movement. He arguably is the most popular politician uh, in Iran. If there were to be a free and fair vote, I would argue he probably would have handily beaten Hassan, Hassan Rouhani. Um, last June. Um, you also have kind of people behind the scenes who are very instrumental in the, the rise of the reformist movement. Um, one individual who has a very interesting background is Said Hajarian. Uh, he was a former member of the intelligence ministry in Iran who became kind of one of the intellectual art architects. And, and for that reason, um, they tried to assassinate him. Uh, I think he, 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 he took a bullet to the cheek and he, he remains um, disabled to this day, his speech is slurred, but um, he was someone who, um, by all accounts, was an incredibly important intellectual force behind the reform movement. Um, some of the, 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 they also had religious leadership who were advocating for religious form, reforms, people like Abdul Karim Surush, uh, whom some of you may have encountered here in D.C. because he's been exiled for the last, last decade. And, and as John mentioned, uh, many of those folks who were hostage takers in 1979 later went on to become leaders of the reform movement, like Abbas Abdi. Now, um, I think that it's, 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 it's useful to point out that um, politically, culturally, the reformists have much more in common, I would argue, um, with the, the, uh, the, the current presidential administration, the administration of Hassan Rouhani, then they do kind of liberal uh, uh, exiles, liberal Iranian exiles, or, or even kind of secular, um, secular uh, Iranians who are based within the country. And I think th this is an interesting um, paradox to point out that many 
Iranian reformists aren't necessarily li aren't necessarily liberal, and many Iranian liberals aren't necessarily reformist. Um, you know what that means is that when you you talk to these uh, reformists, if you talk to them about kind of liberal ideas which are debated now in the West, such as uh, gay marriage, um, you know, women's rights, all these whole host of issues that, that are hotly debated now in the West, I think they will come across as extremely traditional, extremely conservative. And when I say that I many Iranian liberals are not reformists, I think many liberals, Iranian liberals, no longer have faith and the ability to reform the Islamic Republic into a more democratic system. So, so I think this is, this is a paradox. I, I remember um, when I was based in, in Tehran years ago, there was a Norwegian journalist who came to interview one of the most progressive of, uh, of the reformist intellectuals, a guy called Ali Reza Ali Vitabor. And uh, she was very surprised when she was kind of asking him about all these you know, liberal uh, issues and, in, in, in Norway, which were being discussed, that he, you know, he, he, she said, in Norway, you would be kind of the ultra conservative, but here in <laughs> Iran, you're ultra liberal. Um, <clears throat> now, let me move on to, to the second question, and that is, what are their goals? What is the reform movement in Iran hoping to achieve? Uh, Tom Friedman, many years ago, I think, had a good line about the reformists in Iran. He said, they've seen enough Islamism to know that they want less of it. And they've seen enough democracy to know that they want more of it. You know, I think that's that's probably a, a good baseline to to understand um, the reformists. Um, if I put them in the context of U.S. Uh, um, U.S. domestic politics, um, the debate between reformists and Iran and the so-called the principalists or you know hardliners as we often call them, you know, is is somewhat akin to the debate between scholars of the U.S. Constitution in that you have the strict strict constructionists, people like Scalia, who say, listen, this document which was written is set in stone, and if you try to change its meaning or, or fiddle around with the world, then it loses all of its, all of its value. And these, this is the worldview of the, the hardliners, the principalists in Tehran. They say, you know, the values that were espoused in the 1979 revolution uh, can't be changed, because if we start to change our principles, then the entire thing can unravel. And in contrast, the reformists uh, remain loyal to the republic. I think this is important to emphasize. These are not people who are calling for revolution. There are people who are products of the system. They remain regime insiders, but they say in order to preserve the system, we have to reform the system. And they're similar to those who say uh, in, in the constitutional debate in the U.S. that uh, the revolution is, uh, the, the principles of the revolution should be a living document, similar to how people here say the, the U.S. Constitution should be a living document which needs to evolve with the times. Yeah, maybe it made sense in, in the late 1800s that, or late 1700s that um, everyone had a right to bear arms, but you know, today with the advent of, 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 of um, um, guns, as, the, as they were, um, you know, that no longer makes the same sense. Likewise, in Iran, they say, well, Maybe death to America, death to Israel, the hijab, maybe all these made sen things made sense in the context of our 1979 revolution, but <clears throat> we need to adapt these principles to, to 2014. And as I said, some of these reformists want to um, kind of adapt and modernize the Islamic Republic, reform the Islamic Republic for the sake of politics. That's someone like... Um, Said Hajarian, who says that you know we, we taint politics when we mix the two, when we re mix religion and politics, and some of them some of them want to to separate these two institutions, religion and politics, for the sake of religion. That's someone like Abdul Karim Suruj, who says that you know we taint religion when we separate religion and politics. But you know I would argue, as we saw during the 2009 uprisings in Iran, the Green Movement that the reformists still haven't managed to coalesce around the common end game. It's not clear if you were to assemble kind of the top 15, 20 reformist uh, leaders in Iran, if you were to ask them, you know, what is it that you're hoping to achieve exactly? What are, you, what are your goals? What is your end game? I'm not sure they would be able to come up with a, with a, a precise list or, or a strategy of what it is that they're trying to achieve. They have kind of these, these broad aims, but when you pin them down, 
um, it's of oftentimes difficult to get something concrete. And, and, and I think this goes back to a word which in Persian we, we, we call maslahat, which means expediency. Um, and I think this is a, a frustrating element for, for those who, who interview the reformists because on a private level, if you're interviewing them one-on-one, -on -one, they will tell you, of course, this current system doesn't work. You know, it's uh, the velayat varie, the system, the rule of the jurists is an antiquated ideology. It doesn't um, do us any good in the 21st century. But we can't say that publicly. Or, you know, of course, it doesn't make sense for us to be adversaries with Israel. Um, um, you know, Israel, in fact, can be our ally against the Arab countries, but we can't say that publicly because it wouldn't be expedient. So privately, they will advocate a lot of views which um, makes them sound, you know, very, very progressive and not that much different from many Iranian liberals, but, but publicly, they're very rarely willing to advo advocate those views. And you could argue perhaps for good reason because those, the few of them who have been willing to articulate those kind of views have either been imprisoned or exiled. Um, let me move on to, to well, let me just, w one more point about kind of what, what are the reformists, what are the goals of, of the reform movement? Um, I think <coughs> when, when you would talk to people um, and ask them, well, what type of system do you think Iran should emulate? You know, if you look around the world at various political systems, um, what's one system that you think, you know, could be, um, could be manageable in, in Iran or achievable in Iran. And you know, several years ago, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but several years ago, an example which many pointed to was Turkey. You know, Turkey is a country which is, it's, it's Muslim, it's traditional, but you know, it's independent, uh, it's, it's prosperous, uh, it has relations with all countries around the world, and kind of culturally is, is quite similar to Iran. So, so Turkey was a model which um, I think was um, appealing for many Iranian reformists uh, back in the day, given kind of the increasing authoritarianism of Erdogan, I'm not so sure if that's still um, a model which they, they seek to emulate. But, you know, uh, you know as, a, as kind of a broad tenet, I would say that if you look back, if you go back to 1978, 1979, if there was kind of a philosophy which really appealed to these former revolutionaries turned reformists, it was this philosophy of anti-imperialism, that the less Iran uh, interacts with kind of rapacious um, imperial Western powers, the better it is for Iran's economy, its politics, uh, and its uh, socio-cultural um, uh, situation. Um, I think now that, that has been reversed, and instead, instead of um, believing in anti-imperialism, I think many reformists would uh, advocate the foreign policy of reintegration. Instead of wanting to fight the outside world, they want to be part of the outside world, and that would be beneficial for Iran's uh, economic model. Now, lastly, I'm just going to talk about what is their strategy. Um, as I argued, um, I think that had the Arab uprising succeeded in turning authoritarian systems into democratic systems, um, the argument of the Iranian reform movement would have been undermined. Um, instead of um, this argument for gradualism, I think there would have been romanticism about the prospect of abrupt change. But since that hasn't happened, and also due to the election of Hassan Rouhani, I think this philosophy of gradualism and patience has again been rehabilitated, if not vindicated. Um, during the Khatami era, the, the, the philosophy, the strategy of Said Hajarian um, was, uh, he called it pressure from below. We need pressure from below, uh, from the population, and then negotiation at the top. So if there's grassroots pressure, then we can negotiate with the conservatives on top. Um, I would say their strategy now is restraint from below and death at the top, meaning let's just wait for the supreme leader to die because not much is going to happen before Ayatollah Khamenei is going to die. And I think, you know, as I said, this is their latest kind of um, psychological mood. It's one, it's one of realism, that, you know, we don't have a monopoly of coercion. The, the, the hardliners have a monopoly of coercion. And so we should be patient and we should be realistic about how much we can, how much we can, we can, we, we can change. And, um, you know, there's, so, so, you know, I just end on saying that I think that 
the philosophy of reform of gradualism has been rehabilitated, if not vindicated. But I'm not sure if the reformists themselves, meaning the, the individual actors I was talking about, uh, are, are going to figure very prominently in Iran's future for, for the next five to ten years. As I was saying, you know, they're, they're now, Mohammad Khatami is now 70, uh, Saeed Hajarian is, 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 you know, disabled, he slurs his speech, and I think that, that idea of gradualism, of, of gradual reform, I think has been, has been rehabilitated, but I think there will need to be a whole host of new leaders in order to, to lead this movement. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kadi. Mehdi, the conservatives. <laughs> Um, thanks all for um, coming, and thanks to um, Hale for inviting me. It's a, mm, it's really a great honor to be here. Um, <coughs> I try to uh, keep my comments very brief and uh <coughs> let you to open the floor to question and answers. But before uh, starting, I would like to uh, say something about what uh, Karim said. Karim talked about the death of supreme leader, and this is something that I don't like to hear because um, I'm writing a book on the uh, supreme leader, <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't want him to die before I finish my book. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, nobody buys it. So I have economic interest in praying God to keep him alive uh, as soon as. Uh, no, I'm they right. live forever anyway. So yeah. You don't <laughs> <do>. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, I'm I'm asked to talk about conservatives in Iran. Uh, if we had a conservative Iranian conservative in this room, he would have been uh, uh, felt insulted by this label. Iranian conservatives do not call themselves conservatives, um, unlike a reformist who proudly uh, define themselves as reformists. Conservatives um, like to be uh, called principalist, or even they um, prefer right-wing uh, label uh, much better than conservatives. Uh, <coughs> conservatives doesn't sound very well in Farsi. And this is one of the uh, um, ways that uh, Westerners try to understand or make sense of Iranian politics. And uh, this is one of the reasons why we me uh, misunderstand uh, Iranian politics, because we try to put Iranian uh, politics within the uh, Western conceptual, uh, conceptual framework and apparatus, which sometimes uh, uh, mislead us. <coughs> also, another word which is, uh, um, which I found also misleading is the term quietism, which does not have any uh, Persian or Arabic uh, equivalent uh, to describe those ayatollahs who uh, oppose the idea of political Islam and so on. Anyway, so uh, conservatives um, in Iran um, are not supposed to conserve anything. Uh, unlike conservatives in, in other places. Uh, uh, the, the notion or the concept of conservatives was created by French uh, after the uh, French Revolution to uh, describe those who advocate uh, the, the idea of uh, returning to the pre-revolutionary uh, status or pre-revolutionary ideals uh, or values. In case of Iran, um, ironically, we describe those who advocate the revolution itself as conservatives. Um, I prefer to call them revolutionaries because uh, this is what they want to uh, call themselves and this is what they are really. Um, these people, revolutionaries, uh, they have uh, been um, changed. Uh, in the first decade of Islamic Republic, uh, they've been revolu uh, revolutionaries, or what we call conservatives. They have been formed around the uh, 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 leadership. And always leader, leader, the leader of Islamic Republic, the supreme leader of Islamic Republic, was the center for uh, revolutionaries. 
In the first decade, uh, revolutionaries were leftist. Those who, um, you know, invaded um, uh, and occupied the American embassy in 1979, um, and later on became reformist, as uh, Karim um, explained. Uh, they had the upper hand, and they were close to the supreme leader. And uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, Khomeini was advocating these people against uh, the right wing, or those who have not been uh, left, or those who have been against uh, a, a, a socialist agenda for the economy, and so on. In the, in the second uh, um, decade of Islamic Republic, and um, after the death of Ayatollah Khomeini, and the beginning of the reign of Ayatollah Khamenei, what we see is that uh, right wing becomes revolutionary. Because this is right wing that uh, gets uh, uh, connected to the supreme leader and becomes the main political basis for his uh, 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 power. In order to understand the con uh, conservatives, as, as uh, you might want to call them, we have to understand the notion of Belayat al faqih or the guardianship of jurists, which is the basis for the uh, Islamic Republic. Islamic Republic's political philosophy is based on the notion of the guardianship of jurists, or, or Ayatollah. It says that an Ayatollah, um, an Islamic state is not only uh, a state that implements uh, Islamic law, but this is a state that is run by uh, an, uh, an expert in Islamic law. An expert in Islamic law is an ayatollah, is a jurist. So the only person in, uh, that makes um, an Islamic state uh, a legitimate Islamic state is the ruling Ayatollah. So without ruling Ayatollah, even if you implement Sharia, uh, um, you wouldn't have a, an Islamic government. Like, you know, since uh, Safavid dynasty four centuries ago, we had a monarchy in Iran which made uh, Shiism, or the Shia branch of Islam, the official uh, religion of the state. But according to these people, to these revolutionary people, uh, and on the top of them, Ayatollah Khamenei, Khomeini, uh, this did not make the government an Islamic government. An Islamic uh, government should necessarily be governed by an Ayatollah. But there is a problem, because when Ayatollah Khomeini came to power, he found out that Sharia uh, does not provide all the necessary means for governing the, the country. So, for example, in, in the Sharia, you cannot, uh, uh, the, the music is forbidden, but you cannot have a TV and read a radio without music. In Sharia, women are not allowed to uh, show their face or make uh, other men to hear their voice if they are not relatives. But how we can have art, movie industry, cinema industry, a TV, radio without, uh, you know, using women? Um, or in, in Sharia, Ayatollah Khomeini himself, he said that women cannot participate in any election when uh, Shah wanted to hold an election. Uh, but after revolution, how you can deprive half of Iranian society from political participation, especially if you want to do a revolution. So Ayatollah Khomeini found himself in a position that he needed to uh, cross the boundaries of Sharia or Islamic law. So he needed a new theory for that. A new theory was given mm, or was taken from uh, um, Sunni Islam that for a long time governed the majority of Islamic land. Uh, this theory was based on the notion of expediency of the, of, the go of the government. So the ruling jurist was not the person who was supposed to implement the Sharia or Islamic law, but he was the person who was authorized to overrule the Sharia in order to protect the interest of Islamic government. 
In other words, the, the ruling Ayatollah was able to declare the state of emergency any time he wishes and suspend not only Islamic law but also constitution and ordinary law. That notion of Islamic, uh, uh, Islamic government has made Islamic government some sort of Isl Islamic uh, uh, um, um, uh, um, uh, despotism. So what matters is not is not what Sharia says. What matters is was what ruling Ayatollah says. And whether this sh Sharia or constitution now can be implemented or not, it depends on the view of the Ayatollah. So the, the, cu the cult of personality became one of the main component of these uh, conservative uh, uh, ideas or ideology in Iran. Another fact in shaping uh, the uh, mindset is the <coughs> very um, strange marriage between militarism, uh, Islamic ideology, and modern technology. Conservatives in Iran, unlike many conservatives in Islamic world, like you know, many conservatives in, in, in Saudi, for example, they have no problem with using the most advanced technology. So even the, the Islamic believe in militarism as you <coughs> know what they, what they think about the you know, military cap capability of Iran and, and also uh, uh, um, different kind of warfare that Iran is using. And another element is fighting Western uh, cultural influence. Ayatollah Khamenei is obsessed with the idea of cultural invasion since uh, uh, he came to power in 1989. What is interesting is a, sh a, a great shift in, in conservative camp from left to right. This should be understood very well because John has mentioned a very important uh, 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 fact that many of those who invaded U.S. Embassy in Tehran and made anti-Americanism uh, a main feature of their, their identity, they did not have that much problem with the United States, per se. They wanted to uh, 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 remove Bazargan government. They, wanted, they were opposing Bazargan government, and they wanted to take over the government. That's why they used anti-Americanism as, as a tool, as a leverage in their internal fight. And as a student of Ayatollah Khamenei, let me briefly describe how his views on America changed over the time. In the first decade of Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khamenei was not conceived, perceived as a revolutionary. He was not that much close to Ayatollah Khomeini. He was one of the few people who opposed Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa against R Salman Rushdie. And he's the only person who used the Friday prayer podium to criticize the idea of Vilayat al-Faqih, or the guardianship of jurists, the same idea by which he came to power and on which he relies until now for his, le for his legitimacy. When Khomeini died, he totally changed from a pro-American, one of the few pro-American, pro-Western politicians of Iran to one of the most zealous and, and uh, 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 committed anti-American officials. And interestingly, those who invaded the American embassy, and they were the, the 
the prominent anti-Americans in, in Islamic Republic, they became, you know, they changed their views and they became pro-American and pro-Western and so on. So it, say, it says a lot about the structure of Islamic Republic. Those who want to run the country and have access or control over the main power circles in Iran, first, they have to be revolutionary. Second, in order to be revolutionary, you need to be anti-American. So when Ayatollah Khamenei, I hear Ayatollah Khamenei's anti-American statements, Sometimes I feel Americans should not take it personally. It's not <laughs> about America. <coughs> it's because if he loses his anti-American credential, he uses his power inside the country, and he uses his power within the Islamic world. So anti-Americanism became a component of his political identity that even if he believes that fighting with America is not in the interest of the country, he thinks that if he gives up this policy, his critiques would gain power and at the end weaken him. Another issue, Islamic tradition, and they leave whatever they, uh, they don't need. So, there is no Islamic constraint for these political decisions made by Islamic uh, ideologues. In other words, I would say that there is no principle for those who advocate Islamic ideology and try to justify their power by Islamic ideology. And I think Groucho Marx describes very well what they believe uh, in terms of principles. Once he said that these are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think that Ayatollah Khamenei or other conservatives in Iran really believe in firm Islamic principles that would put limits on their decisions. They make decisions and they are able to justify that decision either by Sharia or by Maslaha, which is the legitimate way to escape Sharia. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mehdi. Okay. Uh, before I open the floor, I'm going, I'll go, I'm going to ask the first question, and then I'll go to uh, Mr. Khosar. OK. We covered almost everything. And allow us to continue to refer to conservatives. We know we mean revolutionaries. Is that OK <laughs> for the sake of them? Um, what about the revolutionary gods and their roles? I mean, I want uh, brief answers on, on that issue because we didn't cover it. And they are an element that we need to deal with. Um, let me start with Carrie, very brief. Well, I would say that the you know, revolutionary guards are, are, like all of these groups, conservative, reformists, they're not a monolith. There are 125,000 men with differing worldviews. But what I would say is that at the moment, the senior leadership, the senior cadres of the revolutionary guards are handpicked by the supreme leader. He cult cultivates them. He, sh he shuffles them frequently in order um, that they don't kind of establish their own independent power base. And I haven't seen any signs that they're not loyal to him. What, one thing I would say about the Revolutionary Guards is that, as we all know, over the last decade, as a result of Iran's economic isolation, they become very wealthy. And so in many ways, the anti-Americanism, uh, 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 anti-imperialism of the Revolutionary Guards, it's, it's cloaked in ideology, but in many ways it's also driven by greed, uh, because they fear that in a more open, meritocratic Iran, which is getting foreign investment from abroad, which, in which kind of Iranian, Iranians who are educated abroad, they come back, you know, th that is a, is a disadvantageous environment for them because they can't compete with the shells and the totals and the chevrons and they can't compete with Western educated Iranians. So, so in many ways, they prefer the status quo isolation, but it's not necessarily because of ideology, but more because of financial expediency. Does anybody want to add something? Shout, you want to add? Yeah, I would only add that 
Um, while the Supreme Leader appoints the um, commanders of the Revolutionary Guard <coughs> and can change them if he wishes, it is also the case that he has to remain sensitive uh, to their um, policies and, and wishes, uh, and th therefore part of the positions he takes on, on the U.S., on negotiations, um, uh, must be shaped by the sensitiv sensitivity he has to maintain the support of the Revolutionary Guard. So they really are a, a force, not only in the economy, but in politics as well. And I think we need to add that the last couple of years have seen the commanders of the Revolutionary Guard not only play a much larger role in uh, internal security, but also freer, increasingly feeling freer to express their views on political issues. John, do you want to say Mehdi Nahim? Okay. Um, Mr. Kosar and then Farah Nazanja. By the way, there, uh, I'm told that AV is having, says there is a, say, okay, please forgive me, but one question. Agai Khalaji, will you reply to that question? <laughs> Quickly, mm -hmm. briefly. I have lots of questions. No comment. No, no comment. <laughs> okay, no comment. Okay, that's right. Farah Naz, please. Paranaz Ispahani, Woodrow Wilson Center. My question to anyone on the panel is, the Supreme Leader is alive and kicking. Um, the Revolutionary Guards are still very, very important to him and a very important part of the anti-American sentiment. We're in that scenario, the Amer US Iranian talks that are going on, how far can they go? Thank you. Who want John, you want to take this? No, no, that, that's an excellent question. Um, all I can say is nobody knows <laughs> at this point because you, you have, I think Mahdi pointed out very well, uh, as recently as three days ago, Holly, you sent me the text of a speech that yeah. the Supreme Leader gave to the, Homo Faro, the, the Air Force technicians um, and in honor of their switching sides in 1979. In, in 1979 um, and there's some pretty harsh, some very harsh language in there. Um, and if you, if you take the logic of that language, you would say, well, there's no hope. These are these talks aren't going to go aren't, aren't going to go anywhere because these are, this is this these are the same old insults uh, that we've seen for 34, 34 years. On the other hand, um, by all that we read, also in other in other sources, the process the process of the talks seem to be going in a more or less orderly and professional uh, um, um, and professional way. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing we're going to uh, uh, we're going to see. I think our administration um, and I think both sides have have made a decision that they're not going to overreact or even react to every harsh statement, every perhaps ill-judged statement that comes out of the other side, because I think it's pretty clear there are going to be a lot of them. Anybody else on the panel wants to take this question briefly? Brief yes, uh, but I, I think uh, that um, in last 25 years uh, since Ayatollah Khamenei came to power, all Iranian presidents uh, have tried to break the ice in relation with uh, Iran. Um, as I said, it, um, I'm personally, I'm very uh, skeptic and pessimistic. Uh, and I don't think that the, the permission Ayatollah Khamenei gave to Rouhani to openly negotiate with Americans, uh, uh, that's uh, an unconditional, uh, uh, long-lasting permission. Uh, we have seen um, his silence over the um, previous, the, the current agreement, uh, Geneva Joint Action uh, Plan, um, and uh, this silence has been interpreted by many analysts as his way to end this agreement in future if he wishes. So uh, the fact that Ayatollah Khamenei let uh, conservatives in Iran to harshly and openly criticize Rouhani and has in his diplomatic team, it means that uh, he's not 
totally supporting uh, Rouhani. And there is a, a serious possibility in future that he think that, okay, we have achieved uh, what we wanted uh, and we don't need to go further because one of the main achievements uh, ha that uh, has already made is that the international consensus against Iran in terms of can, can, uh, sanctions <coughs> has been uh, destroyed, has been gone, and it is very hard to imagine that it can be formed again in future, and also we can say that the U.S. ability to enforce existing sanction has been weakened. So these are things that Ayatollah Khamenei find them as um, already great achievement, and he might think that, okay, it's, it's enough, we don't need to go further. It, this is possible. I'm not s expecting or, you know, I'm not predicting, yeah. Um, there is a question from the overflow which is very intriguing, so let's see who wants to take it. What is the panel's view of the early signs of an Israeli-Iranian thaw, and how will the IRGC respond to these moves? Will they remain faithful to Ayatollah Khamenei, even if he agrees to this thaw? Who wants to speculate? Karim, let's start with you. Go um, ahead, I'm the Sunni Shia divide, so, so I'm not optimistic about a, a major thaw, but you know it's a slight improvement of what it was during the Ahmadinejad era. Your third pillar is becoming very iffy these the days. Hijab. The hijab yeah. is now a skimpy piece of yeah. cloth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to take the Israel thing? Okay. Um, did you have a question in the front? No? Okay. Yeah. Yes, you did. Uh, can you wait? You got an answer. Okay. Uh, yes, please. Just wait for the mic. Thank you. I uh, see Michael Kurtzig, who was in Iran a number of times in the 1970s and visited a number of villages. You've talked this morning about Khomeini, presidents, the Revolutionary Guard. What has the revolution done for the common pr purpose, for the common people? Has the standard of living incre improved? Has the level of living improved? What revolution is normally supposed to improve lives? Is there anything like that in Iran? Charles, you want to take that? Well, I think if you look at <coughs> a number of criteria, education, for example, um, is very widespread. Um, literacy is much higher now than it was before the revolution. And I think I'm right in saying, you know, r roads to villages, the extension of electricity, that kind of thing to villages, um, yes, I mean, it has changed. And there is um, not only at the village level, but you come up, you know, one, one level, the... the um, uh, circulation of elites, which I spoke about. I mean, the fact that many, many people from the uh, lower and middle class and working class are now doing much better. I don't think anyone can doubt that. Now, now whether these change changes would not have taken place given the trajectories of development under the monarchy is another question. They probably would have and probably much better. I mean, given the extraordinary waste of half a trillion dollars under President Ahmadinejad of oil revenues which were very badly used. Uh, Henry, did you have a question? Yeah, yes. I can shout. Uh, we've talked about ideology and personal intrigues and groups and that sort of thing. There's another quality that goes unmentioned. Anything like that. But they had code words for, uh, they had code words for that. Um, and. You know, frankly, um, if you look ar uh, um, if you look if you look around this if you look at around this country, we the United States has been one of the great beneficiaries of the anti competence drive. <laughs> uh, if you go into the yellow pages and look up dentists, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, for example, or go to the NASA telephone book, or go to Silicon Valley, go to Silicon Silicon Valley, you will see exactly what I'm talking about. Anybody? No. Okay. Uh, right or wrong, right, rightly or wrongly, that Rouhani is a competent diplomat and he's able to talk to uh, P5 plus one uh, much more effective than the previous team 
and through the nuclear talk he can solve at least lot some of the economic problems and then we're gonna have a better situation and better time to deal with democracy and human rights in other words unfortunately democracy and human rights aspirations has been marginalized evolutionary uh, ends but they're not willing to pursue revolutionary means and and in this context I think that the Iranian regime's aid to the Assad regime in Syria to to uh, utterly uh, pulverize any opposition um, served them both uh, externally and that they managed to save their only uh, regional ally but I would argue it also served them internally because when Iranians look on the television sets and they see what Syrians are now suffering with um, you know almost half the population displaced um, 130 140 thousand casualties I don't think anyone in Iran has an appetite for that type of tumult so I think that people still have these goals but I, I, I don't think in the next five to ten years um, we're going to see those types of mass protests because the regime has both an ability and a willingness to use force to continue to crush people do you want to add anything to it? I'm going to take uh, the last question from the back because we didn't take any question. Yes. Um, yes, yes, that's our last question. Thank you very much. Alan Kiesweter from Dendons. Uh, my, question, my question is for Kareem and for Mehdi. Uh, what happens when there is a death at the top? For example, would Rouhani have a chance, he's a cleric. Okay, let's take another quick question. Hanif, very brief, please, the back, because we ignored the back. Sure. Uh, thank you, um, since the Geneva deal, Speak louder. since the Geneva deal, uh, many people are optimistically uh, looking ahead towards um, opening of a U.S. intersection in Tehran. And I was curious to, to get the panel's take on if they in fact thought that maybe um, the Supreme Leader could tolerate uh, the aesthetic imagery of Iranians lining up to get into that U.S. Uh, intersection, or is it more beneficial for him to have Iranians uh, currently travel to Dubai and Turkey, uh, the status quo? Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> it was very difficult to understanding, but okay. Mehdi, very briefly answer. Okay, again, the I don't like to hear anything about the death of Khamenei, uh -huh. but um, <laughs> Uh, it really depends on uh, which uh, context, uh, um, um, in which context he leaves the political scene. Uh, I think if he leaves the political scene tonight, um, um, uh, the president um, would be one of those influential people that can shape the transitional period. But uh, clergy would have much less uh, role in uh, um, appointing the new supreme leader than it had in 1989. Uh, and on the other hand, a revolutionary guard uh, and other non-clerical uh, faction and forces would have much bolder role uh, in, in that. Um, uh, and I don't think that uh, uh, the institution of the leadership would continue to be as powerful as it is now under Khamenei. I think it's going to be much more ceremonial, and the power would be transmitted to other institutions, uh, especially Revolutionary Guard. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I want all panelists to address this question. Carrie? The, say, uh, well, after the leader? After the leader, if there is such a thing. Yeah, to, to paraphrase Yogi Berra, making predictions about Iran is very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I actually, this is a question which I asked people like Nasser Hadian, who is sitting in the back, who's one of kind of the reform movement's chief international scholars. Uh, the answer that I commonly get is if Khamenei were to die tomorrow, um, God forbid for, for Mehdi, um, <laughs> someone like Hashimi Rafsanjani has a lot of support amongst the, the uh, assembly of experts, the, the group which would need to decide the next supreme leader. Um, I, I think someone like the former head of the judiciary, Ayatollah Shahrudi, would also have a, have a pretty decent shot. 
Um, with regards to Hanif's question about the opening of an intersection, I thought you were starting to almost answer your own question in saying that that aesthetic imagery of you know, Iranians lining up for a kilometer, two kilometers to get a visa to go get to the United States would be quite embarrassing. And in, in fact, someone, a former senior Iranian official has participated in these meetings with, with the leader um, specifically about this issue, said he raised that point in saying, you know, people would say, well, what's, what's that death to America and, and what's this? <laughs> that, you know, everyone wants to go to America. Um, I've spoken to, maybe John can comment on this, because I have spoken to people at the State Department who say that there is a way to set it up in which um, that office would be there, but you would still have to go to Dubai uh, to get the visa. But, but at the same time, I think that <coughs> I, I think that his obsession is the death of Khamenei would face the Islamic Republic w with, a, w with a kind of a crisis because there really is very little experience in appointing the supreme leader. It's true that there's a mechanism in the assembly of experts that's supposed to uh, do this, but the previous time it really was a very small coterie of men around um, Khomeini, Rapsanjani, and a few others who made the, the decision, which was then endorsed by the um, assembly of, um, of experts. So I don't think we really know um, how this is going to work in reality rather than in theory. Um, in addition, it's really quite amazing that, uh, I mean, the vague answers we already got tell you this, that we don't really know who are the possible successors to Khamenei. There's no really prominent senior clergyman who is a natural for the choice. And even though Rafsanjani, you know, is a very s capable person and, and still has support in the country, after all, it was the same assembly of experts that didn't give him the chairmanship the second time round. So I think it's a very open question. I don't think the, even in the inner circle they have thought very seriously about it. John? Uh, on, the, on the prediction, those of you who know, if any, those of you who know me, uh, know that my record of prediction uh, on Iran is terrible. <laughs> uh, the baseball image, maybe maybe 300, which would be great if I were a baseball player, which would be great for a baseball player. But uh, it is a good. I mean, what what's what's clear is that what's held the place together, um, and other speakers have have indicated this is this 25-member uh, men's club um, of senior senior people outside the. Republican institutions, the theological revolutionary um, state, and we all know who they, who they are. Well, uh, I guess timing is everything, because if there are enough of those people still around when he goes, maybe the, the place would have a better chance of hold, holding together. But if, if, uh, if, if um, age catches up with them and that group splits apart, that group splits apart or is no longer with us, it's going to be much harder. Um, Hanif, on your question on the intersection, uh, you're right, at the day, uh, November 4th, the day that we were captured, we had a backlog of 60,000 visas. <laughs> visa, 60,000 visas. A lot of people knew something that we didn't, uh, basically. I mean, they wanted, they, they knew the signs were not, they knew the signs were not good. I think Kareem is right. If we did open an intersection, uh, it would not deal with visas uh, there. That would just not, not work. Um, I, for one, and it may be because of my experience, uh, uh, my particular experience, I would be very wary of doing that um, under current conditions because uh, today maybe everything is, is, okay, um, uh, is okay, but remember uh, the 13th of Aban, the 4th of November is still marked um, as a, uh, is still marked by demonstrations as though this was a good thing. And as long as that goes on, I'd be very hesitant to send my colleagues back into a situation like that where as soon as something goes wrong, as soon as there's an upset in the Middle East, there's an upset here, an upset, an upset there, um, we, could see the, the, we could see a rerun of what happened. Now it might not, sequels are never quite the same as the original, yeah. as you know, but it could happen. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, two points, uh, as I said, this is the first of uh, three meetings on Iran in the next three months. And secondly, on the 18th we of February, we are showing a movie that was directed by, uh, quote unquote, that's how she presents herself, a Jewish American woman who took her six-year-old son, went to Iran for three months, 
in the summer and lived with three different Iranian families, and this is her the film from those three months. So you are welcome to join us for the screening of that movie. And my apologies if the room is a bit uh, cold, because always after the meetings, people come up to me and say, this is a freezing room. I finally found out we do that on purpose to keep you all awake. <laughs> so please join me in thanking the <laughs> panelists. Thanks so much. Thank you. Merci.